So uh, we are very happy to have Peter Baumans here from the University of Luxembourg to tell us about the Hertzbrook isomorphism for exotic non-commutative surfaces. Uh, thank you very much uh, for the invitation. Uh, it's a pleasure to speak in what is uh, one of the most exciting seminar series uh, that is currently going on online. Um, and today uh, I want to talk about um, a paper uh, that Dennis uh, and Michelle and I wrote um, a few years ago uh, because I've given talks about most of my recent papers and most of these talks are, well not most of these talks, but most of these papers are now uh, on YouTube and therefore I am uh, having a phobia of repeating myself uh, and uh, I don't want to bore you to death with speaking about something that you've already seen, which might be uh, 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 I mean, it's a phobia, therefore it's an, an, an uh, what's the correct word, an ill-conceived fear of this. Uh, but still, um, I decided to speak about something that I don't think that many people have seen me talk about yet. Um, only Arendt uh, might have memory of this uh, from uh, a few years ago. Um, but I also think this is a very fun topic, uh, and it's, it combines some, some history. Uh, some very um, uh, classical objects. And so the first classical object um, that I want to talk about uh, is uh, the topic of Hirzebruch, a uh, very famous algebraic geometer, his first paper. So when he was a PhD student, he wrote a paper um, in 1951. Uh, and this is the paper in which he introduced Hirzebruch surfaces. That's why they're named after him nowadays. And uh, I used to work in Max Planck, and there you see a, a picture, uh, or a painting rather, um, of old Hirzebruch. Um, I, I didn't know what uh, young Hirzebruch at the time of this paper looked like, so I googled a bit, and here is a picture of young Hirzebruch. Um, and so in this paper, uh, he mentions a certain isomorphism, an isomorphism that we uh, nowadays are uh, very familiar with, that is the isomorphism between the first Hirzebruch surface, so maybe I should say what my notation for Fn is. This is the uh, projectivization of O plus On on uh, P1. And uh, he mentions uh, that uh, there is an isomorphism between this projectivization and the blow up of P2 in a point. And it doesn't really give a proof. And also he attributes this to Hopf. And so maybe saying that the uh, Isomorphism should be called the Hirzebruch isomorphism is a bit wrong, uh, but um, there is this thing called Stigler's law uh, that says that things are always named after the wrong person. So maybe this is a nice instance uh, of Stigler's law um, in practice. Also, Stigler's law is named after the wrong person. Um, so that's uh, maybe a good reason to call it the Hirzebruch isomorphism. Um, so. This is a very classical thing uh, that you learn once you learn a little bit about uh, the birational geometry of surfaces. And in the title, so now we know already what the Hirzebruch isomorphism is for the actual Hirzebruch, the first Hirzebruch uh, surface. Uh, but there are non commutative surfaces um, in this title. And I want to talk a little bit uh, about what these are, because this is the part of the talk um, that uh, I want to introduce you to something that uh, you might not be too familiar with because this is somewhat of a niche um, area. And so we're looking for non commutative surfaces. And this starts uh, also uh, quite a long time ago with Artin and Shelter, Mike Artin. Um, and this was then continued uh, very quickly after the appearance of that paper by uh, Artin, Tate, and Van den Merch, Artin and Zang, and many, many others. Um, and what they were looking for were non-commutative analogs of the projective plane. So what's the motivation for uh, their uh, definition? It's the following. P2, the ordinary uh, commutative projective plane, we all know that this is the proj of the polynomial ring in, two var in three variables. And the nice thing about uh, coherent sheaves on P2, which is the object we all like to study in the derived seminar, uh, we don't study so much the topological space P2, but rather we study the topological space or ring space P2 uh, via its uh, 
abelian or derived category of coherent sheaves. And uh, Ser, he showed that uh, coherent sheaves on P2 are actually equivalent to a category, categorical construction called Kuger. And how is this thing defined? This is defined as taking the category of graded modules. Oh yeah, we're working over the complex numbers to make our life easy today. Things are non-commutative already, so let's not make our life more complicated by doing non-commutative and arithmetic things simultaneously. Uh, and so we take the category of graded modules, uh, because here we used uh, the polynomial ring in three variables as a graded algebra to construct uh, the proj, and therefore P2. So we can look at graded modules over this graded algebra, and we can quotient out by a subcategory. Uh, and so this quotient is called a SER quotient. So this is a SER subcategory. And we quotient out those graded modules, which are finite dimensional. So this is now a nice abelian category. And the input that we had here is just a graded algebra. And so this works not just for P2, this works for many other, or for all other projective varieties uh, by taking homogeneous coordinate ring. Um, but what is important to observe is that in this Kuger construction, we don't need commutativity. We could just look at left modules or we are actually looking uh, at left modules uh, when I say uh, graded modules over the polynomial ring. Um, we could look at uh, left modules over a non-commutative graded ring and quotient out uh, those which are finite dimensional. And again, we will get a nice abelian category. And this is what uh, Artin and Shelter uh, set out to do in 1987, or well, the preprint was probably from a year or two before that. And what they did, was starting to look for analogs of the polynomial ring in three variables, which have nice homological properties. Um, and in uh, honor uh, of their paper, these such algebras, and we're not gonna define the precise axioms needed uh, for this, because that is not essential to understand what's going on, but these are nowadays called art in shelter regular algebras. Um, and if we take such an art in shelter regular algebra, the way it's been uh, discussed in their paper, so really an analog of the polynomial ring in three variables, and we apply this uh, construction of an abelian category to it, so we do this Kuger construction, um, what we get is something that we could call coherent sheaves on a non-commutative P2. And the important thing is that now there is no topological space or ring space. I can even, uh, there's no ring space, at least not in general, um, but there are uh, sheaves on it. Yeah, this is uh, what Fermat was also doing. The margin of this thing is too small to contain any details of what I want to write. Um, okay, so. Let's talk about some examples. Oh, yeah. Can I ask a question? So, I mean, so far, what you said is true for every projective surface. So yeah, 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 yeah. But the important thing is, uh, the important thing to observe here, so I talk here about uh, nice homological properties. And um, P2 is the only surface which has a homogeneous coordinate ring, which is of finite global dimension. All other and this is for specific polarization of P2. All other polarizations will have uh, the vertex of the cone, and therefore um, the, the graded algebra you use will not be of finite global dimension. And so that is one of the ingredients in the definition of being art in shelter regular. So yeah, this equivalence here doesn't depend on it being P2, but when we start talking about art in shelter regular algebras, we are only looking at um, analogs of polynomial algebras. There is much more I can say about this, but let's restrict uh, to the examples here. Um, and so the first type of examples, um, those are really the easiest to define. Um, and those can be defined by observing that this polynomial algebra 
in three variables is a quotient of the non-commutative polynomial algebra uh, by the commutativity relations. This is uh, not a complicated observation, but this is important to note that this algebra here, so before the quotient, is not an Artin-Shelter regular, uh, regular algebra. This is an algebra which has many distinct properties uh, from the polynomial, the usual polynomial ring in three variables. For instance, the global dimension of this thing before the quotient is one. This is global dimension three. Um, so it's definitely not uh, of the right type, but once we take this quotient, of course we get the uh, usual polynomial algebra, but now we can do something. We can uh, do what uh, people in deformation theory like to do. We pick some scalar, uh, some invertible scalar Q, and we just plug in Q wherever we seem fit. So I could do this uh, three times here. I could also pick three different Qs um, and stick them uh, uh, and stick three, three different Qs in there. Uh, that's also not so important today for us. Um, but this is something we can do, and we get a nice uh, Artin Shelter regular algebra. And the Kuger of this graded algebra is not equivalent to coherent sheaves on P2 if Q is different from 1. Uh, of course, if Q is 1, then we just have the usual definition of the polynomial algebra, commutative in three variables. So this is one um, easy example uh, to keep in mind of a non-commutative projective plane. So this here, this abelian category is a certain non-commutative projective plane. And so now we already see something interesting. We don't have one non-commutative projective plane in the same way that we have one projective plane. For every Q, we will have a different uh, non-commutative projective plane, so we get an interesting family of non-commutative projective planes. Um, and uh, so these skew polynomial algebras, which are introduced by Manin, they have the benefit of being easy to define, uh, but arguably more important and more interesting are uh, Sklianin algebras. And they uh, originated uh, from mathematical physics, and they also predate uh, have to predate uh, Artin and Shelter. Um, and what do you do if you want to define a Sklianin algebra? You pick a point in P2, and you have to exclude a finite set of points, and let's not be precise uh, which uh, set this is. And then we can use the coordinates A, B, and C to define an algebra A, which depends on A, B, and C. Um, and we have these uh, coefficients in front of uh, these relations. Um, yeah, there's not much more I need to say here. And uh, what we now get is another non-commutative P2. And what is interesting about Sklianin algebras is that to study their algebraic um, or categorical properties, so if you want to study the Sklianin algebra as a graded algebra, or you want to study this abelian category Q or A, um, there is always an elliptic curve and a translation on this elliptic curve in the background. This is really the geometry uh, which controls uh, all the geometry and algebra uh, and categorical properties of this category. And so this is somehow, oh, scrolling is a bit slow. So a little bit of historical context, Artin and Shelter, they studied these Artin Shelter regular algebras uh, very algebraically. And then it was an insight uh, of Artin, Tate and Van den Berg a few years later that um, you can actually use algebraic geometry, namely this elliptic curve, um, to study the properties of these algebras. And there is a, the Hesse pencil of uh, cubic curves, uh, and using the coefficients a, b, c, um, you can uh, write down the elliptic curve and the translation on this elliptic curve uh, very nicely. So this is a very rich and beautiful subject. Um, and I don't want to get into the details today. This is not a, a survey of non-commutative projective geometry. Uh, I want to talk about exotic Hirschberg surfaces or exotic non-commutative surfaces. 
And I just want to say, um, the slogan to keep in mind here is that Artin Tate and Vandenberg, and then uh, later on uh, by Bombal and Polishuk, they classified all these non-commutative P2s, so classification of P2 and C, in terms of a cubic curve, so not necessarily an elliptic curve, but often it will be an elliptic curve, and an automorphism. So it doesn't have to be a translation, but of course, often it will be a translation. Um, and starting from this, we can get non-commutative projective planes, um, but this is not where geometry, more non-commutative geometry wants to stop. We want to continue there and do constructions of new objects out of old objects. And two important constructions um, that we want to do with surfaces um, are blow-ups. If we have a surface, we like to blow it up or blow it down, depending uh, what kind of surface it is. And this was introduced by uh, Michel van den Berg in 2001, or if you want to uh, refer to uh, preprint dates in 1999, this becomes important for the next reference. Um, and let's not get into details here, but what happens in his blow up construction is that he can blow up a point which lies on this cubic curve. Um, so there is only a curve worth of points that you're allowed to blow up on a non-commutative P2, at least in the sense uh, introduced uh, in 2001. And for every point on this cubic curve, you can do a blow up, but there are somehow no points outside uh, the cubic curve that you're allowed to blow up um, in this setting. The second construction is a non-commutative version of uh, Hirstebrook surfaces. And so this was introduced by, uh, again by Michel. His name is uh, pervasive um, in the subject. And the year of the paper is 2012, but really this is a preprint from 2001. Um, so you can really see these papers as uh, contemporary instead of uh, 12 years apart. And what is a non-commutative P1 bundle? Well, this is a relative version of this Kuger construction, where instead of uh, a graded algebra over the base field, you want to construct a graded algebra over P1 or a curve, uh, any curve. And uh, what you do is you're looking for a certain uh, object E. So if this were a rank two vector bundle in the usual sense, we could take the greatest, the greatest symmetric algebra of E, take its relative approach, and what do we get? We get uh, a P1 bundle. We've seen that uh, Kuger allows us to do non-commutative objects, and so we're looking for a sheaf of graded non-commutative algebras where we change the input away from a rank two bundle to an object which is different from the left and the right. Uh, so we're looking for a um, what is called a sheaf bimodule um, in the literature. Uh, but we can just think of this as a, uh, say, free Mukai kernel, uh, and we allow it to have two different uh, OX structures, but we still want it to be somehow ranked two on the left and the right. Uh, because for a non commutative for a P1 bundle, an ordinary one, uh, we work with a rank two bundle. And now we, uh, in this construction here by Michel, um, he works with a uh, object E, which is rank two on the left and the right, but the structures might be different. And so this gives rise to either non commutative del peso surfaces because we are allowed to iterate this construction. So this blow up here, blowing up uh, a point on the curve, we can actually do a simultaneous blow up of points. And in this way, uh, we get what are uh, rightfully called non-commutative del peso surfaces. And by doing uh, certain non-commutative P1 bundles, we get non-commutative Hirschberg surfaces. And this is still not what we're looking for. Um, so this is still the advertisement part for non-commutative projective geometry and not so much advertisement part for, oh, this is what uh, we did uh, in our work. Um, because all of these constructions that I've introduced so far, they all arise as families of categories. Sure, 
that is not the interesting thing here. Um, but they all contain a commutative surface. So what we did is we took something we already knew, namely P2 or a Hirschberg surface or uh, a Del Pezzo surface, and we took a non-commutative deformation. So it doesn't really matter uh, whether we take an abelian family or a family of abelian categories or a family of triangulated categories, this can all be made precise. Um, so this begs an important question. And uh, given the fact that we're only 20 minutes in, I think you can feel what the answer is going to be. Is every non-commutative surface of this type? And of course, I am not choosing or giving any definition of a non-commutative surface. Let's just pretend that we recognize what a non-commutative surface is if we are given one. Um, so I don't want to formalize uh, really what a non-commutative surface should be. Um, but we can try to come up with a classification and see whether there is something uh, new that we haven't found yet or not. Um, so this is really the guiding question. Can we do some kind of analog of the Enrique Scudari classification of surfaces? And this is really something called Artin's conjecture, because this is uh, a birational classification of surfaces. And I don't want to... Uh, try to answer Artin's conjecture, that is a, a bit too ambitious for me, but I want to talk about certain non-minimal surfaces exactly uh, in the same way as uh, we talked about Hirstebrook's isomorphism being an isomorphism of the first Hirstebrook surface with the blob of P2 in one point. So let's now talk about uh, non-commutative surfaces and a possible classification. So I should say possible, and I should also say uh, numerical classification. And so we're looking for abelian or triangulated categories, which are somewhat surface-like. And so we want things like global dimension two for the abelian category. We want something uh, called a geometric T structure. We want some kind of analog of properness. We don't want to do affine uh, varieties. We don't want to do uh, smooth and projective varieties. And this was done, uh, maybe I should say some years. This is, I think, uh, 2015. And Sasha did a uh, related thing, um, 2016, 2017, I think. Um, and this starts from the observation that uh, the Serfunker, a gadget we all like and love, acts unipotently on the Gorton D group of X, where X is now just an arbitrary uh, smooth projective surface. Uh, smooth projective variety. So that's a nice um, property uh, of uh, the Serre functor in the geometric setting. And let's assume that we also uh, have a numerically exceptional uh, basis uh, for the Euler form. So this numerical Gordon D group is some Z uh, N. And um, we want a basis in which the Euler form becomes upper triangular. So this is implied by having a full exceptional collection, um, but there are situations such as a uh, um, situation of uh, phantom categories where you also have uh, a numerically exceptional basis uh, with respect to the Euler form. And this end here, uh, we can now look at what this n or what happens in uh, low ranks. So if the rank is two, then our Euler form is just a, uh, a two by two matrix in this basis. And one can show easily that um, this unipotency, so let me underline uh, the unipotency because that's really the important condition here, um, forces n to be two and we recognize a derived category we all like and love, the derived category of P1. But that wasn't very interesting. Uh, let's go uh, one rank further. And uh, now our Euler matrix has the following shape. It's a nice three by three matrix. And unipotency of the uh, Serre functor now gives us a very important classical object called the Markov equation. And somehow, I only realized this now, but maybe I want to make this talk uh, 
uh, an attempt at the world record, at least in the derived seminar, of the most uh, 19th century references. Um, so at least here is now the, uh, this is the first uh, 19th century reference only. Um, there will be more. Um, stay tuned for that. And so the equation now says that these A, B, and C can't be arbitrary. No, we want uh, A squared uh, plus B squared plus C squared minus A, B, C to be equal to zero. And this is something that uh, has been of interest. Uh, I mean, let me put a question mark here because I'm writing this from memory. And uh, what can be shown is that all solutions of this equation, this is a nice Diophantine equation, can be obtained by a mutation process starting from the initial solution given by ABC equal to 333. Three, three. And this word mutation um, is an interesting word here um, because we also know what mutations are for exceptional collections and we recognize the balance on exceptional collection um, well, rather the dual balance and exceptional collection, so not the one with line bundles, but the one um, which uh, involves the cotangent bundle. Uh, if we start with this uh, 333 uh, solution, and because all of these things are invariant in smooth families, we also get that derived categories of non-commutative P2 uh, fall in this uh, situation here. So the derived category of a non-commutative P2 has a full exceptional collection whose Euler form um, in this basis is of the same form as for P2. And what uh, the Tannhofer and uh, Van den Berg then did, they uh, classified what happens in rank four and up to mutation again, um, there are now two types. Um, one is a discrete type. Maybe should maybe should call this a discrete. No, uh, a unique case. And we also have a discrete family. And we call these A and B M. And the matrix in a certain basis uh, for A uh, is this matrix. And uh, the matrix for B M, there's a parameter M here, uh, has the following shape. And what we recognize here is if we know the derived category of uh, even Hirschberg surfaces, uh, we recognize, especially if we look at P1 times P1, but numerically, the, uh, all even Hirschberg surfaces are the same because we can degenerate uh, one to the other. Um, so we all get, uh, they all give the same matrix here. So we get uh, even Hirschberg surfaces and we can also make them non-commutative. And the topic of today's talk is really what happens here in this situation. Um, and let's talk first about m equals zero. If m equals zero, uh, we get that this object is orthogonal to all of these objects. And therefore, uh, we can give an easy solution uh, or an easy construction of a variety uh, with these properties. We just take P2 or a non-commutative P2, and we take the disjoint union with a point. So this wasn't very exciting. Um, but rather, we are now led to considering exotic non-commutative surfaces. Uh, well, we don't know yet why they are necessarily exotic. Uh, maybe they're not exotic. Uh, let's uh, talk about this. So let's focus on this BM case now. And let's choose a different representative uh, of this equivalence class. So this is now just a uh, different representative of the equivalence class. Uh, one that I prefer looking at. Um, and here we recognize uh, P2. I mean, we already recognized P2 uh, with the dual Baleson collection there. And now we still have this uh, MMM part here. So Was there a... Before you go on, can, can I ask, I mean, this is a classification of, of what? So these matrices, they're just, uh, this is a classification of um, numerical data, namely, candidate numerical Gordon D groups, which have surface-like properties. 
So if you impose this um, unipotency and you look at a low rank uh, um, bilinear form or a, a bilinear form on a, 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 this lattice of, of low rank, then you get this Markov equation and uh, the solutions of it, and you have this classification by uh, Natanover and uh, Van den Berg. There's no classification of any categories or any surfaces happening here, rather these point towards, possibly point towards the existence of surfaces we haven't encountered yet. Um, it's a bit like writing down Hodge diamonds of surfaces, uh, and you can wonder, is there a surface with this Hodge diamond? I'm just wondering, I mean, you know, everything you said so far would be satisfied by any variety or maybe any even variety if you... Uh, any even dimensional variety. Yes, but the uh, the rank. Uh, so if you want a variety with an exceptional collection uh, and the dimension of your variety is D, then the exceptional collection is length at least D plus one. Yeah, yeah. So I, I was just wondering the whole time whether when you say surface like where, whether there's something secret that, they have, that you haven't told us yet that fixes the dimension to be two rather than something. Um, no, not really. Um, there is something you can do, uh, but let's not um, get into that. Um, this has to do with, um, how do I say these words correctly again? Um, I mean, it was my first paper, so I should know uh, what goes into it. Uh, you can look at the anti-symmetrization of the Euler form, and for surfaces you can show that this thing Damn it, I forgot what I wrote in my first paper. I'm getting old, I guess. Um, we can talk about this uh, in Gather Town uh, afterwards when I can look at what I wrote in that paper. Um, so if we take m equal one, having dealt with the case m equals zero, because this is just numerically, um, we can recognize something which looks like the Euler form on uh, the first Hirschberg surface, which we know is uh, also uh, the blow up uh, of P2 in one point, and we really recognize Orlov's blow up collection in this particular manifestation. Um, if we look at the usual uh, exceptional collection on uh, F1 using Orlov's blow up formula, we'll get a different matrix, um, but that is fine because we're allowed to mutate. And uh, all of these correspond also to the odd uh, irreducible surfaces. So we've now done m equals zero, m equals one, and now we finally get um, to the uh, topic uh, of today's talk after this uh, long advertisement break. Let's look at m equal two. And so, as far as I can tell, there is no smooth projective surface whose numerical Gordon Lee group has rank four, and the Euler form fits into um, this equivalence class uh, of Euler forms BM. There's a little question mark here um, because um, it is claimed, for instance, in this preprint uh, by the Tannhofer and Vandenberg that this is indeed the case, but I can't really give a, a fully rigorous proof of this except by just looking at the classification of surface and saying, sure, doesn't look like there is one, um, but there is um, something to be done here, maybe. Um, but Rather, um, if we accept that there is no such uh, non-commutative and uh, no such smooth projective surface, the question is, is there maybe an exotic non-commutative surface? Um, and is there maybe some kind of blow-up construction for this non-commutative surface? Um, because this thing looks very blow-up-y. We have uh, P2 and we have something which looks like we're tagging on uh, something we've blown up. Um, but because of this observation here, this cannot be a deformation of a surface. So we can't just look at uh, the Ricci scolar classification and uh, say, oh, this is the one we need, and then start deforming it. Rather, we have to do something new. And we can do a first construction and what we have to do here is something uh, called a fat point blow up. And uh, we do a fat point blow up of a non commutative P2. So we've taken some 
three-dimensional quadratic arc and shelter regular algebra. So whatever data we need to define a non-commutative P2. And so we have this uh, non-commutative P2, this abelian category. And now something really interesting happens. Um, namely, there is a, a dichotomy based on the properties of Z of A. And Z of A, uh, we're a bit German here, uh, this is the centrum uh, of A, this is the center of our algebra. And this is a uh, commutative graded algebra. And uh, two things can happen. It could very well be that the non-commutative graded algebra A is finite as a module over this commutative graded algebra. In that case, it makes sense to look at the proch of the center um, because the Hilbert series will be uh, of the same growth rate. So we get a commutative graded algebra um, whose growth rate is that of the homogeneous coordinate ring of a surface. And so the proch of this center is a surface. It's a projective surface. Um, and on the other hand, it could be that A is infinite as a ZA module, and then we're done. We don't have to look at this uh, in this situation, um, although it will uh, reappear a little bit. No, it won't even uh, reappear later on. Um, the important thing is um, that this is possible, and I will say in a second when this actually happens. And what you can now do is consider the chiefification of this uh, graded algebra A, which is a graded module over the center. So it defines uh, a sheaf of algebras on the proch. And we can look at this as a coherent sheaf of algebras. And the important word now is that this is a uh, sheaf of non-commutative algebras. And geometry tells us precisely when this happens. Um, for instance, in the Scleaning case, so this is um, a most well-known case uh, of art and shelter regular algebras. One can show that A is finite over the center. So this is this um, case being discussed there. If and only if um, the translation on this cubic curve, on this elliptic curve, um, is of finite order. So you can really study non-commutative algebraic properties using the geometry associated um, to these gadgets. And we're going to uh, skip uh, some details here. Uh, let's just say that there is something called the central proch construction um, um, due to Lebrun from 95, uh, together with a classification result uh, due to Van Gastel and independently uh, Artin and De Jong. Um, this one is unpublished. Um, they're both from uh, the year 2000, more or less. And what they did, uh, wait, why is my layout like this? I don't think this needs to be here at all. Um, what this uh, thing constructs is this proch plus details that I don't want to say, is just P2. So that is nice. We've con we started with a non-commutative analog of P2. In some cases, this was a finite uh, module over its center. Um, we can take the projectivization of this graded algebra, and we get P2 again. Um, and we get a sheaf of non-commutative algebras on P2. And uh, the sheaf of algebras is what is called a maximal order. I will say in a second uh, how you should think about this. And the important thing is that Cuber of A is equivalent to the category of left modules of A uh, on P2. So we do have a ring space that allows us to uh, describe this abelian construction. 
Um, but this only works in this finite over the center setting. Uh, and so we're closer to geometry than we were uh, uh, to begin with. So that is nice. And so what is now a maximal order? You already see some pictures happening. So uh, this is sufficiently geometric to do pictures. Um, a maximal order, uh, let's just say that this is an Azumaya algebra um, outside a divisor. And this divisor is again related um, to the geometry of this uh, cubic curve. This is now a possibly different cubic curve D. And this cubic curve will be very important to us. Um, and now we can do something. Namely, uh, we can take a point on this P2. Uh, so this P2 here is the proj of ZA, although I am cheating. Um, but often it is just a, a P2, this proj. And I can take a point on the cubic curve or I can take a point away from the cubic curve. And I mentioned Michel's blow up and uh, Michel's blow up construction only worked for points starting on the cubic curve that was present, although I didn't say how, in art and shelter regular algebras. And what's important is that this construction also works if there is no such finite over the center case. And what you can do now is blow up P or Q. And so let's first blow up P. So this is when we uh, blow up P. And P is now on the divisor. Oh yeah, it's written there. Um, and what we can do is we can pull back A to the blow up. And it turns out that this thing is not a maximal order necessarily. Uh, so we have to choose a new maximal order containing this non-maximal order. And this is one way of interpreting uh, Michel's blow up construction in this very specific case where it is finite over the center. And uh, what we get in this way is just a exceptional collection of type B1, because this is now just a non-commutative Hirstebrook surface or a non-commutative um, blow up or a blow up of a non-commutative P2. But this we already understood. Now what we do is take a point in the Azumaya locus. Uh, so we take a point Q outside this cubic divisor E. Um, so the picture here is the exceptional divisor does not intersect D. Uh, so the picture is really in the second case uh, where we blew up uh, P2 in Q. And uh, a theorem that one can prove, um, and that I proved uh, jointly with Denis Presotto, is that this pullback algebra, so we're looking at the, to be really precise, the derived category of coherent sheaves of left modules over the sheaf of algebras pullback of A on the blow up of P2 in a point. This thing has an exceptional collection of type Bn, oh yeah, I was using letter M, of Bn, where M is essentially, again, sweeping some details under the rug, the order of the translation. So this is a funny coincidence that um, this finite over the center case happens if and only if the translation is finite order. And the nice thing is that this fat point blow ups, so we're blowing up a point in the Azamaya locus, gives us an exceptional collection uh, where the order determines the type that we're interested in. So that is nice. Um, and we've now found a blow up description of all these um, non commutative surfaces uh, for all of these types. But this is not the way it happened in history. Because uh, before Dennis and I came up with this construction, they were looking at the class B2 in particular, and up to mutation, you can find a different representative uh, of this class. And we can represent B2 as follows. Uh, we can represent it um, where we recognize a P1 and a second P1. And then here we have this funny thing in the middle. So the question now is, whether there is a exotic non-commutative surface 
where you use some kind of P1 bundle construction. And so this is not the usual non-commutative P1 bundle construction because that would give rise to this um, piece, uh, this block in the matrix. Um, so this second construction was uh, performed by uh, the Tannhofer and Perizotto. And we need some kind of asymmetric non-commutative P1 bundle over P1. And this is now of type 1, 4. So it's asymmetric in the sense that the rank is different from the left and the right. So you want to construct a um, symmetric algebra out of this, because that's what you do in a P1 bundle construction. Um, but you have to be very careful because the object that you're using is different from the left and the right already rank-wise, not just the structure, but the rank is really different. And so omitting uh, many, many details, um, what they showed, uh, the Tano and Presotto, is that if we take a morphism of degree four from P1 to P1, so a finite cover of P1, we can construct a non-commutative P1 bundle of this asymmetric type such that um, the derived category has a full exceptional collection of type B2. So that is good. Um, yeah, so this is just a uh, symmetric algebra construction where we use the morphism F um, to find a uh, one four uh, sheaf bimodule. And uh, we can construct a symmetric algebra out of this with lots of details, do this uh, relative cube construction and we get uh, a different realization. And now there is an elephant in the room because we have two constructions for B2, just like we had two constructions for B1, or at least one, fan, one surface of type, uh, or two surfaces of, of type B1, namely the block of P2 in a point and the first Hirschebruch surface. And the natural question now is, are they the same? question mark is already there. Um, are they the same? Um, and the important and interesting thing here is that we're now not just looking at a single surface, unlike what Hirschebruch did uh, in the 1950s. We're looking here at uh, a class of abelian categories or two classes of abelian categories, which naturally come in three-dimensional families. Or, uh, both are naturally three-dimensional families, yeah. Um, so let's do the counting. Uh, let's do heuristic counting. So this fat point blow up, we have to look at uh, moduli of cubic curves together with an involution, roughly. Um, and so moduli of cubics, that is uh, a one dimensional family. And then uh, finding a, an order two automorphism there uh, is just a finite amount of data. So we have one moduli of uh, the cubics. But then we're still allowed to pick any point outside um, this divisor D in this uh, construction of the central crotch. And so that gives us two moduli. One plus two is three, and everything is good. And uh, for the P1 bundle construction, this morphism of degree four. And now let's uh, already introduce the very classical thing that people in the 19th century um, could have studied, although I don't think they really did study uh, base point three pencils of binary quartics, but this was machinery that existed in the 19th century. Um, if you do the dimension count here, um, there are, uh, there's a five dimensional uh, space of quartics. Um, we take the Grossmanian of two dimensional subspaces. Uh, we have a PGL2 acting on it. Therefore, we have uh, three moduli. And let's cut, uh, how do you say this in English? Let's cut the chase short. Chase short. Is that an expression in English? Can a native speaker say yes or no? Is that an expression? Um, let's just give the answer to the, the elephant in the room uh, because we are running out of time. Uh, yes, they are the same. And so what is meant by this very imprecise statement? Oh, cut to the chase. Thanks, Justin. Um, what does this mean? It means that uh, there exists a bijection between equivalence classes of abelian categories uh, in both constructions, or between both constructions. 
So for every element, so for every construction in, for every element in one construction, we can find um, uh, an element in the other construction. Um, and that is still a meaningless statement. Let me finish the sentence. Between the two constructions. With an equivalence of these categories. It, it, we're not just saying, oh, we have a variety there, a variety there. And we're saying, oh, these points are identified because we're working over an uncountable field. Therefore, saying there exists a bijection is some theoretical nonsense, but rather there really exists an equivalence of categories for each of these um, uh, pairs we have uh, associated with each other. And this is the Hirstebruch isomorphism that I alluded to. Oh, here's Hirstebruch uh, isomorphism that I alluded to in the title. And now there's not just a single Hirstebruch isomorphism, there's really a three dimensional family of uh, Hirstebruch isomorphisms. And I don't want to give um, the gory details uh, of the proof because we only have uh, eight ish minutes left. Also, the gory details of the proof involve um, saying the word Clifford algebra approximately 15 billion times. And that is pretty boring uh, to hear me listen uh, saying that word uh, 15 billion times. Um, so, Rara, let's discuss a little bit about the beautiful classical geometry that goes into this. And the funny thing is, that somehow the essential geometric input, um, anything else is just saying Clifford algebra over and over again, is something that could have been shown in the 19th century, except that um, Italian geometrists at that time never really had a reason to look into this. So the classical correspondence that we obtained really was inspired by trying to find this equivalence of categories, um, but it's a very classical-ish uh, statement in the end. Um, and so we already know that um, these P1 bundles, these asymmetric non-commutative P1 bundles, they're associated to morphism of degree four, and therefore we can encode them as base point three pencils of binary quarks, a linear system inside uh, O4 of dimension two, and we don't want any base points. What is missing for now, but we do have this, that's what I'm gonna introduce now, is a similar geometric description for the fat point blowups. Because if you want to relate something very classical, such as these linear systems, we better have something equally classical uh, to compare it to and then build from there. And uh, what one can show is that this maximal order on P2, in the case M is equal to two, um, is a Clifford algebra in the sense that it appears uh, when you are studying uh, base point three nets of conics. So we're looking at a family of conics in P2. Uh, and from this, you can define a Clifford algebra. And this is a Clifford algebra uh, on the net. So the net is a three dimensional linear system. So we get a uh, family on P2. And the discriminant cubic of this Clifford algebra is parameterizing singular conics. So what we're doing is we are taking a base point free net of conics and we're blowing up a point outside the discriminant. So we're choosing a smooth conic in the net. So the choice, oh, I'll use the letter P, but I think I want to use the letter Q here be consistent with uh, what happened before. So we're choosing a smooth conic in the net. And the beautiful thing that one can now do is set up a geometric correspondence between these two very classical pieces of data. Um, and I want to just very briefly sketch uh, one direction uh, of um, this construction. So the base point free net of conics um, is some three-dimensional subspace uh, of this linear system. And we choose a smooth conic in this uh, net. And 
let's say that this one is given by uh, the vanishing of some section, some degree two uh, equation S0. And we can extend S0 to a basis, the cardinality three of our vector space V. And then we can look at uh, the intersection of our smooth conic with uh, the two conics associated uh, to S1 and S2. So we're looking at a pencil, uh, a sub pencil of the linear system and look at the base locus of this. And what we get is we get a um, degree four divisor on a smooth conic. So we get a degree four divisor on P1. And out of this, uh, we get, um, therefore, we get two degree four uh, divisors, I should say. And from this, we get uh, two um, binary quartics, F1 and F2, uh, which describe these uh, degree four divisors. And so we've very briefly uh, shown how to get from uh, a base point free net of conics to a pencil of binary quartics. And as I said, um, the categorical correspondence really just looks like a Harry Potter movie where you shout Clifford algebra over and over again and wave your wand a little bit. Um, and the idea really is to um, translate a Clifford algebra on the blow up, which is a coherent sheaf of algebras on the blow up. You want to find a graded algebra um, whose Kuger gives the same thing. And this, this Kuger, uh, or this graded algebra rather, comes from the asymmetric uh, non commutative P1 bundle. Um, I don't want to give any more details of this. Rather, I want to end with um, a picture because I still have uh, three minutes. And I said I wanted to um, have at least two uh, 19th century uh, references in here. And uh, Sagra of uh, the Sagra embedding frame, um, he classified nets of conics. Um, he found an ingredient or a, a recipe to classify linear systems of quadrics uh, more generally. And um, much, much later, although technically speaking, it could have been done in the 19th century, um, Wall classified pencils of binary quadrics. And Above here, I give the brief setting on how to um, go in the opposite direction. Let's just give the output here. Wall classifies uh, pencils of binary quartics into how many letters are there from A to M? A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H. I have to do this in Dutch. A, B, C, D, E, F. Um, that is 13. There's 13 letters uh, from A to M if you didn't miscount, uh, and someone is nodding, so that's good. So he classified um, pencils of binary quartics into 13 types. Let's look at the first type in his classification, and that is really the most degenerate, somehow, pencil of binary quartics. This is a nice morphism of degree four from P1 to P1. And I said that there is a correspondence between these geometric data, which induces uh, an equivalence of categories. So I have to tell you what the uh, geometric data is. And what I do is I take a cubic, which is a conic plus a line. So that's what is in black. So we take a conic plus a line that is a uh, nice cubic, albeit singular. And what we can now do is take the tangent lines at the intersection points. These lines intersect in a point, and this point is Q, not P. And that is the point we have to blow up. So we can find an art in shelter regular algebra, uh, which is finite over its center, uh, such that this curve D is a conic plus a line. I'm not saying what the translation is. And the point we have to blow up is this unique point determined by this intersection. And this is a somewhat degenerate case because this is the most symmetric case. The automorphism group of these things in either description is uh, one dimensional. And uh, for all the others, the automorphism group is, is, uh, is finite. So all the other types uh, from B all the way to M, uh, they have finite automorphisms. 
Um, and so for each of these types, for each of these pencils of binary quartix, which he gives a classification of, you can nicely describe the cubic curve together with a point in the complement. And it's always some basic construction involving tangent lines or non-tangent lines intersecting in a certain point. Um, and I find this uh, very beautiful how something classified in the 19th century, if you also fix a base point, uh, well, not a base point, if you fix a point uh, which is a smooth conic, um, you get a, another very classical object, pencils of binary quartex. And the final thing, uh, because everything I've said here really works with abelian categories, uh, but if you care about derived categories, um, these Clifford algebras that I um, talked about, so these blow ups, these Clifford algebras of blow ups of P2, they appear uh, in the derived category final trefolds. Uh, and there is a final trefold called call type 3 8. And there is a unique final trefold of this type whose automorphism group is GM. And for all the others in this three dimensional family, uh, there is a uh, finite automorphism group. And this is really nicely parallel um, to the non commutative setting that I talked about. Uh, and this final threefold here is a conic bundle over the blow up uh, of P2 in a point. Um, and it's a conic bundle. As a conic bundle, it's also the blow up of um, 224, which is itself a conic bundle. Uh, over P2, uh, arising as a 1, 2 intersection on P2 times P2. So there's a really funny um, interaction with uh, the geometry of final trefolds. And that's everything that I wanted to say. Sorry for going over time uh, by three minutes. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Are there questions for Peter? So, so, I mean, I have a question just trying to understand this theory of non commutative surfaces more. I mean, mm -hmm. if you take an object in a triangulated category, then in some sense you can blow up at this object, right? By gluing in a, um, <clears throat> you know, by gluing in an exceptional object along yeah. this. Um, and I mean, when would you consider this again to be a non commutative surface? So, I didn't go into details, but one notion that I really like uh, uh, here is this notion of a geometric T structure. Um, and this is an in, a notion introduced by Alexei, who was here, uh, or at least I saw his name before. Um, and uh, so you're looking at a smooth and proper, say, DG category, um, and you want that there. Uh, exist a T-structure, oh, there's Alexei, I see, I see his name, uh, there exists a T-structure such that the uh, SER functor preserves the heart up to a twist. And so you're looking for a T-structure with this property. And so if your abstract construction of just uh, gluing uh, an object um, to the category or adding an exceptional object and gluing it in the correct way um, gives uh, or allows you to construct a geometric T structure, this triangulated category or DG category should somehow rightfully be called a non commutative variety. Um, I mean, we like to say that smooth and proper DG categories are non commutative varieties, but there is a nicer class of non commutative varieties where you have these geometric T structures, which are more tractable. It's not just an abstract object that allows you to do interesting constructions with it, but there's more geometry usually is the idea here. And so that's what um, these non-commutative blow-ups by Michel uh, and these non-commutative P1 bundles by Michel and these fat point blow-ups and these asymmetric non-commutative P1 bundles allow you to do. They allow you to really realize an abelian category uh, such that uh, the serif functor is compatible with this abelian category. This is really what sets apart for me the derived category of, of an arbitrary path algebra and the derived category of the smooth projective variety. Sure, they're both objects I like to study, but the derived category of a path algebra cannot have this nice compatibility with the uh, T structure, except for the Kronecker algebra uh, with two arrows. Thank you. 
Other questions for Peter? And then maybe can you, sorry, I think you said this, but maybe can you explain a little bit about um, how to see this kind of, what it means that these examples you're studying are sort of exotic in this. So, uh, do I scroll up or down? Uh, oh yeah, here is the, the slogan really. This is really the important slogan here. All of these constructions as uh, Michel's original blowups of non-commutative surfaces and non-commutative P1 bundles over P1, they really come in families. You can really do this construction in families. And if you look at the, the right family, there's always going to be a, a projected, uh, sorry, a commutative uh, surface in this family. Um, very similar to the examples that I gave, if you fix Q to be one, you have the ordinary polynomial algebra. If you fix Q to be some different uh, uh, complex number, um, you get a different algebra, uh, which gives rise to a category that you haven't seen yet before. But this category still has all the properties of P2 uh, or of the category of coherencies on P2, namely that's the full exception collection, the Sarah functor is compatible with the T structure, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and by the classification of surfaces, um, the ones that we've now constructed are not, uh, as far as I can tell, deformations of anything we already knew about. So the numerical data, it's, it's like writing down a Hodge diamond and uh, saying, oh, is this Hodge diamond something we recognize? And the answer is no, we couldn't recognize this before because we've somehow classified all Hodge diamonds of surfaces. Um, but we're, here we're classifying different numerical data, we're classifying Euler forms. And that is why they are really exotic because uh, we haven't seen them before. And is the expectation, your expectation is that there should be a lot of these other sorts of exotic examples? Um, I can't really give an expectation here. Okay. Uh, so this construction, uh, this blow-up construction, you can do this in an arbitrary number of points, uh, right. as long as you're outside the discriminant, uh, and you'll get non-commutative uh, surfaces in this way, uh, which are not obtained by deforming a commutative surface. Um, but the classification was done in rank four, and you could try to do the classification in rank five, but the uh, the Fantine problem becomes much more complicated, um, and I don't think it's feasible to hope for a classification. So to really give an answer to that question, we would have to have the classification and try to find a construction uh, for each of these classes and see whether there's something we've missed so far. There might be more, I, I can't say. Yeah, I'm sorry, <coughs> which the uh, Fantan problem is hard to solve? Um, so um, in rank three, uh, so let me so where did I talk about Markov equations? Uh, oh yeah, so here, um, so imposing this unipotency condition in uh, rank three, you get the Markov equation, as I learned from your paper, Alexei, uh, joined with Sasha. Um, so here we have three variables, uh, one equation, and we can solve this nicely. If we do the same thing uh, for these six variables uh, and impose this unipotency condition, if I remember correctly, we get um, two equations and Michelle and Louis were able to classify uh, all of the solutions. If you now do rank five, we get uh, 10 variables, we get... Yeah, but there is also a dimension of variety or uh, a cohomology of, uh, I mean, Hodge cohomology. I mean, uh, you have not just one equation, right? You have several of them. Yeah, the, you, so you're, you could try to look for additional constraints to put, put on this and I've dabbled a little bit into this and I couldn't find uh, a solution. I'm not saying that it is intractable, 
but for me it was intractable and I very much invite anyone who can come up with a rank five classification to do it. And then I'll happily try to construct uh, examples um, of every element in your classification. I think that's a good way of dividing the labor. Someone else does the Diophantine stuff. I do the construction of non-gimitary surface because I prefer um, the latter uh, to the former. I see. Are there other questions for Peter? Um, if not, maybe let's thank him one more time for a very nice talk. Thank and you very much. Who, thank you. And for those who wish to gather or maybe ask Peter some more questions, Arne has just posted a link in the 